I'm going to take the first half, which will give you background information, and Neil will do the last half, which will discuss the implications of open licensing for policies and legal framework. Neil is going to run the PowerPoint. First of all, what is open licensing? Some of you know about it, but not everyone does. We're going to go through this very quickly. On the slides, you'll see that there are links to appropriate places for more information. Neil and I would be very pleased to answer questions as well by email. First of all, an open license specifies what can and cannot be done with a work. It permits reproduction, adaptation, distri distribution without requesting permission from author or publisher. Open licenses do not replace copyright. They, re they substitute all rights reserved with some rights reserved, but the publisher, the government, or the content creator maintains the copyright. All open licenses, except um, for content in the public domain, require attribution. That means authors, illustrators, and publishers must receive credit for the work that they have done. And in pub publishing and education, Creative Commons licenses are the most typical and standardized form of open licensee. They, they give you the legal framework for the license itself. Next slide, Neil. This gives you an example of what can happen with open licensing. We call it a multiplier because the content creators, the graphic designers, the artists, the authors and editors, they all permit open licensing. And then you can create one book, which gives you the possibility to translate it into numerous languages. It also gives you the ability to remix it, to adapt it. If you create a, a work in Malawi and someone in Nigeria wants to use it, it's possible that the Nigerian content creators will want to use Nigerian terms and um, other kinds of changes to localize the work. And with open licensing, this is a possibility. Next slide, Neil. But why is open licensing important for education? First of all, we've heard the term OER a few times during the workshop. OER stands for Open Educational Resources. And these resources are used by educators to make quality content more available and distributed more widely. OER can greatly amplify the circulation and utility of educational content. And this is really important. It creates a legal space for adaptation and translation. Many times you'll go to the web, you'll find a free resource, but there's no license to the resource and you don't know what you are legally allowed to do with it. OER coupled with a Creative Commons license tells you exactly what the terms of utilization are. It's not free though. OER, any kinds of content creation using up open licensing has upfront costs. There's no way to get around it. Um, the uh, quality control costs money. Um, although the target audience is large, um, there are costs in producing the content and organizations need to be cognizant of what those costs are. So open licenses can enable a potentially higher return on initial design investments, but you need to know what those costs are. Next slide, please. This is an example of what OER can do. The organization Room to Read had a grant from um, Reach for Education, which is funded by the World Bank and I think the GBA as well. 
what they did is they went into South Africa, they worked with a group of small South African publishers, publishers who do not have a lot of experience in educational content production. They also worked with authors, illustrators, and designers to produce openly licensed books for young readers. And the South African Department of Basic Education was a partner in this activity. So the books were suitable to the curriculum in South Africa. The books were published in five South African languages. There were 20 stories. They were translated into other languages. Print ready PDFs were created and 100,000 books were distributed. Online versions of the book are free. But if you want print, you must go to the publisher and buy a copy. And this is what's important. This project actually made it possible to pay the publishers and also to pay content creators. But why else is OER um, important? In 2019, at the um, UNESCO General Conference, all the member states to UNESCO approved an OER recommendation that is binding on those member states. And I bulleted here some of the key points that member states are asked to do. They're recommended to strategically plan and support OER capacity building, awareness raising, use, creation, and sharing. They're encouraged to develop or encourage policy environments, they're encouraged to support the creation, access, reuse, repurposing, adaptation, and redistribution of OER. They're encouraged to support the development of comprehensive, inclusive, and integration of sustainability models. And they should monitor policies and mechanisms related to OER. And what's very important as well is that within the OER recommendation, the component gives UNESCO the opportunity to be in touch with the, o, the UNESCO national representatives in every country to help them monitor and evaluate how well each country is doing in OER adaptation. So the UNESCO National Commission for Uganda is going to be in touch with your Ministry of Education at some point. What are the other implications for governments? And this is important. In order to use OER properly, you have to situate the OER policy and implementation in the appropriate de departments responsible for curriculum development. You need to establish interministerial collaboration for all levels of education. You need to put in place appropriate national and institutional ICT structures. You need to ensure that current processes are not made redundant, and you need to leverage existing partnerships for content procurement. And you need to organize training both nationally and hopefully regionally. Next slide, Neil. What is the significance of OER to donors? This is important because in most instances at this point, donors are heavily responsible for assisting national governments in producing content um, for education. And these are just a few examples of donors that are already using OER and Creative Commons licensing. Um, some of you may have heard of the World Bank's Read at Home initiative. They're delivering reading, learning, and play materials in underserved languages in hard to reach homes. Now what they're doing is they're relying on Creative Commons licensing, but they're assuming that because of technology problems, online access is going to be limited. So they're relying on large print runs as opposed to just digital access. USAID recommends that publicly funded resources be freely available and openly licensed. And this is actually um, policy for the United States as a whole at this point. And since 2015, most of USAID's primary grade reading programs 
have required implementing partners to work towards using a CC BY license. That's the license that permits users to distribute, copy, print, adapt, and translate a resource without requesting permission. And we've talked a bit about the Global Digital Library. It uses CC licensing um, for all of its the stories um, mounted on the platform. The, it's, a, it's a flagship initiative of the Global Book Alliance, and it's supported by the Norwegian Agency for Development Co Cooperation. So countries that are already familiar with the benefits and challenges of open licensing might find that negotiations with donors can proceed more smoothly. Next slide, Neil. This is really important. When Kirsty and I have gone to workshops and, and met with authors and with publishers, we're always asked, well, how are we going to make any money using open licensing? We need to have an income to support ourselves. Well, the answer is no, if appropriate contract provisions are in place. Some organizations rely on volunteers. That's particularly true in South Africa. But we recognize that's not possible in most places on the continent because content creators and publishers rely on the income they earn from the work that they carry out. So you can have contract provisions that in place that will make it possible to receive revenue for, for your work. So if content creators um, get a flat fee instead of receiving payment through royalties based on sales, they can make income from that. I should point out here that in many cases, it's very difficult to appropriately receive royalties. And in almost every instance, books for young children do not sell well, except if they're, they're paid for by governments and donors. So a flat fee that is equal to a good royalty should be possible. In some instances, there have been delayed payments. Um, and illustrators and designers should also receive flat fees, but their contracts must contain language that acknowledges that they are producing the resource as an openly licensed document. And the exact type type of license must be specified, as well as who owns the intellectual property. Is it the publisher? Is it the artist? Is it the author? Who's the owner? Who has control ultimately? Next slide, Neil. What about publishers? Publishers are also rightly concerned about possible lost income. Now, Bibi Bakari Yosef, who's the founder and director of Nigeria's Cassava Press talks about building a market for children's books as part of a publisher's core business strategy. She's talked a little bit about children's books being considered loss leaders. You get children to start reading young and enjoying what they read. And then when they grow older, they're going to want to read more and more books. And what BB said at a workshop that we organized, and I think that this is really important, she said our focus should be on producing early literacy books that we can market directly to parents so that they can get into the habit of buying books. We therefore need to create a robust marketing campaign targeted at parents. We should use donor funding as seed funding to jumpstart our initiatives and use it to develop longstanding marketing campaigns the way we do for fiction and other products. Now, if you're on the Cassava Republic um, mailing list, you'll know that BB sends out a mailing just about every month about new books and, and events in um, the Nigerian marketing space. And that might be a good model for other publishers to follow. In the examples that I just gave very briefly, Donors have all paid production costs. Might this donor funding be considered seed funding? If all of your costs have already been paid, 
what about selling the children's books for lo very low prices and could start building a marketing strategy? And what about value added services? Sia Vola, which is a South African organization, doesn't charge for its books because it does so, um, it gives them out free through Creative Commons licensing, but it does charge for practice and exam prep services and some of the other services um, provided through Sia Vola. So that's another model that you want, might want to think about. What about governments and losing control of if um, open licensing is used? Here too, the answer is no, if appropriate provisions are in place. It needs to be clear who owns the copyright and the intellectual property. In some countries, it's the government that owns it. In some countries, it's the publisher, the content creator, or outside consultants. If governments own the copyright in countries where it's normally given, then they keep control of, of the copyright, although they've given um, the possibility of utilization through, through Creative Commons. Now, Sia Vula is an example of this. Once again, it's a South African NGO. Some of its books are published with a Creative Commons by license, and that's the one that allows all kinds of utilization. But the South African Department of Basic Education has said, if you want to use one of these books that has the DBE logo, you must use a CC by ND license, which means that the, um, the book can be freely used, it can, be, it can be circulated, but it cannot be adapted. And that way DBE feels that the control over the contents is maintained. And that means the control over the quality. The other thing is license holders should maintain all the files necessary for both digital and print and make them available in, in an accessible repository. And Neil is going to talk about that in a few minutes. Next slide. Okay, this is just a very brief um, slide on everyone needs to be involved in these discussions, partially because they're new, because the concept of open licensing is new and, and it's also so important. So we know that the Global Book Alliance has been um, supporting the creation of leveled readers in Mali, and it's ensuring the continued viability of Mali's publishers and content creators by training, paying, printing, and they use a CC by NC license. They're also working closely with Malian stakeholders, including the Ministry of Education and the Malian Publishers Association. And GBA is using the same model in Malawi to develop 50 titles. So that might be a model that you want to think about, that model and the one used by um, uh, other organizations um, might be useful for you. Next slide. Neil, do you start now? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go quite quickly. Um, but I, I just wanted to reflect briefly on um, obs the observation that Liz made with respect to uh, the Cassava Republic quotation. And that's to emphasize the fact that we really, in my opinion, need to start looking much more strongly at the early literacy space, particularly as a loss leader for the content creation and publishing industry that brings up levels of literacy uh, amongst the population of African countries to very high levels so that we create the real markets for publishing, which I think are as we get into the teenage years and as people become adults. Um, and I think creating that love of reading at a young age is really critical. It's unfortunately been the case that so much focus on early literacy has just been focused on the technical challenge of getting people literate, uh, usually for functional purposes so that they can learn in school. Um, and I think that that does the publishing, uh, the publishing industries in African countries a severe disservice. 
Uh, and it has historically, I think, prevented the growth of those industries uh, in ways that would make them sustainable and much less reliant on these kinds of educational sectors for their financial well-being. Um, so I'm observing that in relation to the issue of financial sustainability and the compatibility of open licensing with uh, early literacy and with business models for publishers. I think we have to think on a much grander scale about how to create sustainable markets for publishing and for uh, literature. Um, with that in mind, uh, as, as I'm indicating here, in the world of open licensing, we do have a number of online platforms that are sharing stories online under open licenses. African Storybook, Story Weaver, and the Global Digital Library are, are excellent examples of these. Um, and they do provide a lot of access to some, some very high quality stories, uh, well il illustrated stories uh, in a number of uh, African languages. And they also provide for the ability to translate those stories into different languages. Um, but, but a number of challenges limit the impact of these platforms. And I think as you proceed with a reading policy in Malawi, it might be worth just contemplating some of these issues. Um, the one obviously you'll be aware of already, and that is the problem of access to digital infrastructure. So any model for sharing stories and readers with children that's based on an assumption that they will be reading those stories on a digital device uh, you know, mobile phone or a tablet or whatever the case might be, I think is quite deeply problematic. And I think a lot of money has been channeled into and wasted on trying to provide digital access to content for young readers at, uh, at this level. Um, I, I think it's important when we're considering the challenge of early literacy to understand that it's a problem that needs to be solved on a very large scale because we're dealing with very large, large numbers of learners. Uh, and in countries where digital infrastructure is limited, these examples that I'm sharing on the slide here make the point, uh, it really is essential that we focus on solutions that involve printing and distributing those stories into the hands of young readers where they are. Um, so simply providing online access to openly licensed stories that can be shared in a digital form, in my opinion, is not a sufficient solution to the problem. So what that suggests is that what we need to do is also to make sure that those stories, which we can continue to share online, uh, are accessible by publishers and printers to be printed um, on a large scale. And uh, as we've been engaging in this challenge with the Read at Home Initiative of the World Bank, uh, with the Global Book Alliance and with many others, one of the things that's become clear is that it's very important to ensure that when we do use open licenses and when donors invest, uh, donors and governments invest in, in this content uh, and, and make sure that the intellectual property is under an open license in the way that Liz has described, we must make sure that we get the full intellectual property to be able to print on a large scale. And I think this implies two specific things that are important. The first one is to make sure that the DTP files, which lead to the creation of the stories, uh, are also accessible in an, under an open license. And secondly, that we ensure that when we create PDF files, that we create them in a print ready format. Right. In other words, a format that enables publishers to, uh, to, to use those PDFs immediately for very large print runs. Um, the, the graphic that I'm showing here uh, illustrates an example of just one PDF file that we ran through a process and it identifies all of the different ways in which that particular PDF file taken from an online platform is actually not yet print ready. So because that's all been done already, we now have to invest quite a lot of time and effort to fix those PDF files so that they can be printed at scale. Uh, and I, again, I would emphasize here that I think we all win from making sure that this can be done. Uh, many content creators, many NGOs, many publishers that I've engaged with are reluctant to share print ready PDFs and they're reluctant to share uh, DTP files because they think they're going to lose their market. But I think what that misunderstands is that the market at the moment is woefully small. The investment in, in early literacy is about building a much bigger market over time uh, and sharing resources in this way can contribute very substantially to that. And obviously very importantly, particularly from the perspective of donors and uh, governments, uh, it's important to remember that the goal is to get le learners literate. It's not to sustain content creation industries. 
But I think that these two goals are compatible if we think very differently and if we see that there's opportunity for massive growth, not trying to just protect the small markets that exist today. So very lastly, um, here's just a few ideas drawing from the things that Liz has said and the few inputs that I've made um, that, that you might like to contemplate as you think about national book and reading policies for Malawi. Obviously, number one, infrastructure and technology challenges that you're facing in Malawi, uh, as in many other countries, make print essential if children are to have access to books in schools, libraries, and at home. Uh, I think we've, we've been um, uh, sidetracked um, and, and um, uh, distracted by the, the whole belief that digital di distribution of content on mobile devices is a scalable, large-scale solution to this problem. Secondly, open licensing will save government money if it's implemented intelligently. Uh, and it should be embedded very strongly in our opinion in government policies and laws. It can be embedded in ways that don't make it compulsory. In other words, when there's a good business case to be made for not using open licenses, I'm an entrepreneur, I would certainly encourage that. But we need to provide for the ready use of open licenses in our policies. Otherwise, we make it impossible for donors to work effectively in countries and for governments to harness open licensing. And obviously, as we do that, as Liz has, uh, has, has articulated already, we should make sure that there's appropriate provision for fair recompense to all the publishing stakeholders. And then thirdly, is we need to make sure that we invest in the production of high quality and relevant content. Something that really frustrates me, you can hear that I start to get quite passionate about some of these topics. One of the things that really frustrates me is when we seem to think that in countries where we're dealing with African languages and producing stories for African learners, that second rate content that's been cheaply produced is acceptable to them. Uh, my mantra is very simple. If that content is not good enough for my child, it's not good enough for any child. Uh, and I think that that's the basis on which we should be focusing our investment. We should make sure that the stories we're producing are stories that children want to read because they're good. And, be, and that have been illustrated to a level of quality and design that really make them compelling. Because at the end of the day, the objective here is not a functional one of just teaching a child to read. It's actually about creating a love of learning and a love of reading that will last through life. And unfortunately, so many of our young learners are getting through into secondary school and then into university without that passion. And this is highly problematic. So this investment, which is relatively small in the grand scheme of things, is something we really need to be doing properly. And open licensing allows us to make those investments more cost effectively. And then finally, as I've said, we need to make sure in our policies and laws uh, that, that we provide for access to the high quality resource files that are needed to meet those pre-flight print standards so that, so that we're thinking about large scale in our book and, and, and uh, reading policies. Uh, and as I said, that includes both the DTP files and the print ready PDFs. Uh, and from our perspective, obviously, as people who are passionate about this topic, uh, we would argue that if you put these things in place in your national book and reading policy in Malawi, and obviously we'd love to help you with that work if we can, then um, I think we'll have made tremendous progress uh, in, in advancing the field of early literacy in the country. So thank you very much. I hope that's been informative and useful. And obviously, we look forward to participating in question and answer session down the line. Thank you.